Hi, I'm here today to bring to you the historical account of the people who wrote the Declaration of Independence and those who signed it. It's called The Americans Who Risked Everything. It's a story of lives lost, horse flies, and prison ships. I think you're going to enjoy it. We're going to do it in four parts, with this being part number one. Come on back for parts two, three, and four, and enjoy. Thank you. The Americans Who Risked Everything Our Lives, Our Fortunes, Our Sacred Honor It was a glorious morning. The sun was shining, and the wind was from the southeast. Up especially early, a tall, bony, red-headed young Virginian found time to buy a new thermometer, for which he paid three pounds, fifteen shillings. He also bought clothes for Martha, his wife, who was ill at home. Thomas Jefferson arrived early at the State House. The temperature was 72.5 degrees, and the horse flies weren't nearly so bad at that hour. It was a lovely room, very large, with gleaming white walls. The chairs were comfortable. Facing the single door were two brass fireplaces, but they would not be used today. The moment the door was shut, and it was always kept locked, the room became an oven. The tall windows were shut, so that loud quarreling voices could not be heard by passers-by. Small openings up top the windows allowed a slight stir of air, and also a large number of horseflies. Jefferson records that the horseflies were dexterous in finding necks, and the silk of stockings was nothing to them. All discussing was punctuated by the slap of hands on necks. On the wall at the back, facing the president's desk, was a panoply, consisting of a drum, swords, and banners seized from Fort Ticonderoga the previous year. Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold had captured the place, shouting that they were taking it in the name of the Great Jehovah and the Continental Congress. Now Congress got to work, promptly taking up an emergency measure about which there was discussion but no dissension. Resolved that an application be made to the Committee of Safety of Pennsylvania for a supply of flints for the troops at New York. Then Congress transformed itself into a Committee of the Whole. The Declaration of Independence was read aloud once more, and debate resumed. Though Jefferson was the best writer of all of them, he had been somewhat verbose. Congress hacked the excess away. They did a good job. On a side-by-side -side comparison of the rough draft and the final text shows they cut the phrase by a self-assumed power. Climb was replaced by must read. Then must was eliminated. Then the whole sentence. And soon the whole paragraph was cut. Jefferson groaned as they continued what he later called their depredations. Inherit and inalienable rights came out certain unalienable rights, and to this day no one knows who suggested the elegant change. A total of 86 alterations were made. Almost 500 words were eliminated, leaving 1,337. At last, after three days of wrangling, the document was put to a vote. Here in this hall, Patrick Henry had once thundered, I am no longer a Virginian, sir. But an American. But today the loud, sometimes bitter argument stilled, and without fanfare the vote was taken from north to south by colonies, as was the custom. On July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was adopted. There were no trumpets blown. No one stood on his chair and cheered. The afternoon was waning, and Congress had no thought of delaying the full calendar of routine business on its hands. For several hours, they worked on many other problems before adjourning for the day.